Welcome to our first lecture on algorithms and uncertainty. In the first part of this class, we'll introduce online algorithms and competitive analysis. This is a tr very traditional way of analyzing algorithms in the context of uncertainty, namely by doing more or less a worst case analysis. This is sometimes very good because we need very few assumptions, but it also has the, the negative side of being just a really true worst case analysis. And this is why later in this class we'll also see other models of uncertainty where we assume that the world isn't as bad as the worst case. And the example that I'd like to start with today is ski rental. This is a problem that you may or may not have seen before. It is in its basic case very easy, but in the following lectures we will uh, repeatedly use it as a simple example to then see our more sophisticated techniques. So what's this problem about? I hope you remember these times when we could go to the zoo or so and then the question was, do we want to buy a day ticket or do we want to buy an annual ticket? So a day ticket that lets us go to the zoo today but not tomorrow. And this is a good choice if, for example, only today we want to go to the zoo but not anymore later this year or also if we're only going a few times. But at some point, it is actually better to buy an annual ticket. So if you go to the zoo often enough, then suddenly it is better to buy an annual ticket and then you may go as often as you like. And this precise problem is usually in the liter literature called the ski rental problem. How could we model this? How could we model the decision that we have to make whether we want to buy a day ticket or an annual ticket. Let's try to model this mathematically in the easiest possible way. So, in the traditional story, you're, we suppose that you're staying at a ski resort for capital T days, and you can either rent skis which will have a cost of one per day or you can buy them which has a cost of B once and for all. So this is then covers your entire stay of T days. The question might now be what do you know in advance? Do you know that you like going skiing or not? Do you like, uh, do you know how long you're staying at the skiing resort? Do you know how expensive the skis are versus renting them? And for our first algorithm that we'll now define, actually only we'll only need the latter knowledge, namely that we only have to see how expensive is it to rent the skis, how expensive is it to buy the skis. And then we can design a very, very simple algorithm. This very simple algorithm works as follows. We rent the skis 
up to b minus 1 times. And then we buy the skis on the bth day of skiing. So, truly simple algorithm. You just know how expensive it is to rent the skis, how expensive it is to buy the skis, and you now start first by renting the skis. Up to the point where you have spent as much or almost as much money on renting the skis as you would have spent if you bought them, and then you buy them. Let's analyze this algorithm and then afterwards we introduce a general model of what we've just done. So we can now show that for any sequence of skiing and non-skiing days the algorithm's cost exceeds the optimal cost by a factor of at most 2 minus 1 over b. Or, in other words, we are paying at most two, time, uh, 2 minus 1 over b times as much as what the optimum does on this respective sequence. Before we go into any further details what this exact model means, let's first prove this because this is really, really easy to see. Namely, how should we prove such a claim? Well, the thing that we'll do is we'll just make actually a case distinction. How many skiing days will there be? If we let k be the number of skiing days In the sequence, then if k is smaller than b, then the optimum would choose to rent the skis. So we have k smaller than b, which means renting would cost renting each day would cost us k. Buying the skis would cost us B, so the optimum will rent the skis. And what does our algorithm do? You'll see in a second. So the optimal cost is K, namely to always rent. And the algorithm's cost is how much? What is our algorithm doing? Our algorithm rents the skis up to b minus 1 times k is in this case at most b minus 1, so the algorithm is also always renting the skis. So this means that the statement holds.
Now what is happening if k is at least b? Well then the optimal cost is b, namely we want to just buy the skis. And what's the algorithm's cost? Well, this algorithm's cost is now b minus 1 for renting on the first b minus 1 days. And then we'll get another b for buying the skis. And in total, this will give us a cost of 2 times b minus 1. So what's the ratio that we're getting here? The ratio is 2b minus 1 over b, which is exactly 2 minus 1 over b. And this is already the, the proof of this theorem. Namely, we claim that this, this ratio never exceeds 2 minus 1 over b. The ratio is not exceeded in the case that the number of skiing days is smaller than b and it isn't exceeded if the uh, number of skiing days is at least b. This way of analyzing an algorithm's performance is called competitive analysis, which we'll introduce next. The important thing that you'll have to notice is that it works without any prior knowledge. So the algorithm doesn't need any prior knowledge on what is likely to be happening. It is just always not correct, but it always does a reasonable thing. So this is actually a strong perspective if you assume to have very little knowledge or that your knowledge is incorrect or if you don't know how to model your knowledge. There are also other ways of capturing uncertainty. I'll give you an example at the end of this lecture today. But before, let's introduce competitive analysis. Let's now introduce formally the concept of online competitive analysis. How would we generally capture the kind of analysis that we've just done for the ski rental problem? So generally, we are given an input sequence sigma, which corresponds of capital T requests. And so in the teeth step, request sigma T is revealed and we have to process it only knowing sigma 1 through sigma t but not sigma t plus 1 through sigma capital T. So for example To capture the ski rental, we might set 
sigma capital T to one if day T is a skiing day and zero otherwise. And now we call an algorithm competitive if the following holds. So this will be a definition a deterministic algorithm is called alpha competitive if the cost that our algorithm incurs on sequence, sequence sigma is at most alpha times the cost that an optimum would incur on a sequence sigma plus some b and this should hold for any sequence sigma. And what do these things mean? Well we have this C of ALG C of ALG of sigma which is the cost of the algorithm on sequence sigma and C of opt of sigma. This is the cost of an optimal offline solution. And here this B, this may be any constant. So anything that is independent of the sequence. So what does this mean? Our algorithm is run on the sequence sigma and the algorithm is incurring some cost. And we compare this to this C of opt of sigma. This is the cost of an optimal offline solution. And the off optimal offline solution, and this is doing anything that the algorithm is also allowed to do, but the, uh, the, the optimal offline solution may depend on the entire sequence. So here, we assume to know in advance, for example, how many skiing days there will be. Whereas here we have an algorithm that does not know how many skiing days there will be. And we now say that an algorithm is called alpha competitive if the cost of and that the algorithm incurs is no more than alpha times the cost that uh, this optimal offline solution has. Once again, this op optimal offline solution, this knows in advance the entire sequence. And this, uh, to get this optimal offline solution, we even allow unlimited computational power. Here, of course, this is no real difficulty to, to compute the optimal offline solution, but maybe in other settings uh, it is. And so even this is allowed to the, uh, to, to the optimal offline solution to, for example, solve NP-hard problems.
And in this notion of competitive ratio, we also have this additional term B floating around, which may be any constant, which does not depend on the sequence. Sometimes this is helpful so that you avoid some, well, marginal cases, for example, a sequence that consists of only one request. And on these you might do terribly bad, but on the long run you're doing quite well. So this is allowing us some kind of asymptotic analysis here. But in our case of ski rental, we even could do without this. There we just had a factor of alpha and this b was zero. And this is why we don't call this only alpha competitive, or in this case 2 minus 1 over b competitive, but even strictly alpha competitive, or in our case strictly 2 minus 1 over b competitive. So let's call this star and if star holds with b equals 0, the algorithm is strictly alpha competitive. Good. So we have already seen for the ski rental problem that there is a 2 minus 1 over b competitive algorithm. Can we do better? Interestingly enough for the ski rental problem the answer is yes and no. And let's first talk about the no part of this answer. Namely with a deterministic algorithm we cannot get a better competitive ratio so this alpha, in a, if we look at strictly competitive algorithms, this alpha cannot be better than 2 minus 1 over b. We claim that there is no deterministic algorithm for ski rental that is strictly alpha competitive for alpha being strictly smaller than 2 minus 1 over b. So in a sense our very simple algorithm was already optimal because it achieved this 2 minus 1 over b competitive ratio whereas no other algorithm can do better. Which is not quite true as we'll see in a second. No deterministic algorithm can do better. Good. How would we prove something like this? Well, the thing is, we now actually only have to construct a sequence, or given an algorithm, we have to construct a sequence such that the algorithm is no better than 2 minus 1 over b competitive. This is again important if we go back to the definition. This, for every algorithm, or for this particular algorithm, this has to hold for any sequence. So if we want to show that no such algorithm exists, we somebody gives us an algorithm and then we show, okay, there is this one sequence where the algorithm is actually performing poorly. And this is the sequence that we want to construct now. How do we do that? Well, we construct the sequence as follows. We set the length of the sequence to 2b to and we now consider 
the sequence sigma in which we go skiing every day. Now let L be the number of days that the algorithm that we're given, for which we want to show that it is not alpha competitive for alpha strictly smaller than 1 over b, we want to let L be the number of days that the algorithm runs skis on this sequence. And now we'll do a case distinction. What could be different values for L? And we'll see, regardless of what the algorithm does, there is always a case in which this is a bad idea. The first case that we want to consider is that L is equal to T, which means we have the sequence of length T, so 2B, and the algorithm, how often does the algorithm run skis? Well, for example, the algorithm could run skis every day. But then, I hope you realize the algorithm pays to be, whereas renting the skis would cost, uh, buying the skis once would cost only B. So then this algorithm is certainly not better than 2 minus 1 over B competitive. It is even only 2 competitive. So, more formally we have that the cost of the algorithm on the sequence is L or is T or 2B and what's the cost of the offline optimum? This is simply B. So the cost of the algorithm divided by the cost of the offline optimum solution will be 2. So this inequality that we had before only holds with alpha being at least 2. Good. So it's certainly not a good idea to always rent the skis on this sequence. It, maybe it is a good idea, but um, it, is, it doesn't give you a competitive ratio that will be better than 2. Now what else could you do on that sequence? You could at some point buy the skis. So this means that L is strictly smaller than T. which means that the algorithm rents skis for L days and then buys them on day L plus 1. What's the cost that the algorithm will incur now? Well, it is certainly L plus plus b. And now we use the fact that this algorithm is a deterministic online algorithm. It is an online algorithm, so the decision up to day l plus 1 does not depend on whatever happens on days l plus 2 up to capital T. And it is deterministic. So if we now change everything happening from days L plus 2 
to the end of the sequence, then nothing actually will change in terms of the behavior of the algorithm. So we could turn every day that is a skiing day into a non-skiing day after step L plus 1. The algorithm will still buy the skis on day L plus 1, but unfortunately it will only use the skis for that one day because this is the, the last skiing day. So how do we do this? So the algorithm's decision does not depend on sigma L plus 2 up to sigma T. Or, in other words, if we now consider the sequence sigma prime, for which sigma prime is equal to sigma 1, sigma 1 prime is equal to sigma 1 up to sigma L plus 1 prime is equal to sigma L plus 1. And this only consists of L plus 1 skiing days first. and then t minus l plus 1 non-skiing days. We now have that the cost of the algorithm on sequence sigma prime is exactly the cost of the algorithm on sequence sigma because in both cases the algorithm will buy the skis on day L plus 1 so we see that the cost will always be L plus B. And now the only thing that we'll have to do is we'll have to consider different values of L. And now the only thing that we have to do is consider different values of L and see that for every value of L the decision isn't really good because the cost of the offline optimum on sequence sigma prime, this is always the minimum of L plus 1 and B. And you can now see that for every value of L somewhere between, well this could even be 0, and t minus 1, we will have that cost of the algorithms choice divided by the cost of the offline optimum solution. This will always be L plus B divided by the minimum of L plus 1 and B. And this is always at least 2 minus 1 over B. Why is this? Because effectively what we'll see here is, or what we'll see in the um, denominator, this is the smaller of the two L plus 1 and B, whereas in the numerator we'll have 
L plus B. So overall, we see that for any choice of L, there is always a sequence such that cost that the algorithm incurs on this sequence is at least 2 minus 1 over b times what the cost that the offline optimum incurs on this sequence. Okay, there is one thing that I feel is pretty unrealistic about this proof, namely it is how we construct the sequence here. The day you buy your skis is, if, is always the last day that you go skiing. Afterwards you won't go skiing again. This is really, really a worst case perspective on the things. This, this will in reality only happen if there's really somebody working against you or that your choices have unforeseen consequences. Probably in a more realistic sense, you, would, you could assume that, okay, you at least have an idea how likely it is it that you will go skiing again. And this then, then you can of course do much better. But even before that, before we come to such a model where you have a sense of how likely it is that you want to go skiing, we'll now consider one other setting, namely we'll consider a randomized algorithm and we'll see that actually via randomization we can do better we can do a little better in this setting and generally for a ski rental we can do a lot better this is something that we'll see later this semester okay so far we've introduced this competitive analysis for deterministic algorithms now we'll come to randomized algorithms. We'll extend the definition of a competitive ratio and we'll also see that we can do, design a better algorithm for the ski rental problem via randomization. So how does this generally work? We now assume that our algorithm uses random coin flips But we assume that the sequence does not adapt to these random coin flips. This is something that we didn't have to talk about in the case of a deterministic algorithm because there were no random coin flips. The algorithm um, does something, but whatever it does, this can actually even be anticipated. So there is just, it is just clear in advance what the algorithm will do on any sequence. That's why we didn't have to ask those questions in the context of randomized algorithms there are actually different ways of designing this to what extent does the sequence depend on the random coin flips we now assume that the algorithm that the sequence does not depend on them at all and then we say that
a randomized algorithm is alpha competitive if the following holds the expected cost of the algorithm on a sequence is no more than alpha times the cost of the optimal offline solution on the same sequence plus some b and this has to hold again for any sequence sigma and importantly sigma may not depend on the internal randomization of the algorithm. Good. This means what? And this is something there, there are some subtleties here that you might want to understand. Namely, we take any sequence sigma and we ask, what's the expected cost of our algorithm on this sequence? And this expectation, this is just over the internal randomization of the algorithm. This is not related to the sequence. The sequence is just fixed but the algorithm does not know the sequence. The algorithm just does its thing um, using some randomization, but the sequence is coming from the outside, but the sequence is fixed. The sequence does not react to any choices by the algorithm. So these coin flips, they, those are just internal to the algorithm. This is, by the way, the, also the reason why uh, here we have no expectation whatsoever. This sigma, this is not a random variable. This is just something fixed coming from the outside. But still, the algorithm is not, does not know how the sequence continues from here when making its current decision. What could such an algorithm look like? Maybe let's once again go back to ski rental. We have a randomized algorithm for ski rental as follows. I should mention this is just some algorithm I came up with for didactic reasons. It is related to the algorithm which we will see later on, which we'll derive later on as really a good randomized algorithm for ski rental. But for now, just see that there is something that we can do better or how we can get a better performance via randomization. Namely, this works as follows. The algorithm just flips a coin. It flips the coin just right at the beginning. And then with probability, a half, it buys the skis on the beef day of skiing. and with probability a half it 
it buys skis already on the day three quarter times B. So this is this first thing, this is very similar to what we did before, that this was actually, um, yes, this was exactly the same thing that we were doing, that we rented skis for B minus one days, which means nothing that we buy the skis on the Bth day that we go skiing. Now what we add is also, with some certain probability, we buy the skis even earlier. Even if we have seen uh, when we're realizing that we're going skis uh, that we're going skiing for at least three quarter times b days and what i now claim is that this algorithm is 15 over 8 competitive How can we prove such a claim? Well, again, we'll just consider any possible sequence and we are now interested in the expected cost that our algorithm incurs versus the optimal cost of an offline solution. And for this, we'll just see any, consider any possible sequence and in any case, we'll have to bound the cost well, um, that our algorithm, the expected cost that our algorithm incurs by 15 over 8 times the cost that the optimal offline solution incurs. Importantly, by the way, this is a value that we cannot achieve by using deterministic algorithms, at least for large B. For large B, um, we saw that, well, this will be competitive ratio will be somewhat close will have to be somewhat close to two at least good now let's consider an arbitrary sequence sigma And let k be the number of skiing days in sigma. What happens? If k is less than 3 quarters times b, then what we'll do is we will rent every day and the cost that our algorithm incurs is k and this is always happening regardless of the coin flip and so this is why also the expectation of this is k and this is also the cost of the optimal offline solution. Good, so there's not much that we have to do in this case. Then we have the case that k is at least b. What's the cost of the optimal offline solution here? It is b. 
And what's the expected cost of our algorithm? Okay, this now depends on what happens. We'll now have with probability a half, we have something, and then with probability a half, we have some other thing. And what is it that is happening? With probability a half, we have b minus 1 days of ranting, and then we buy the skis, or with probability a half, we have 3 quarters times b minus 1 days of ranting, and then we buy the skis. So this here means we rent b minus 1 times, and this here means that we rent 3 quarters times b minus 1 times. And now we can see how big is this. And if you do the math here, you will see, okay, this is at most 15 over 8 times b. Why this? Because we have a half times 2b plus a half times 3 quarters plus 1 times b. So overall we have at most 15 over 8 times b. And this in this case is exactly 15 over 8 times the cost of the optimal offline solution. And then we have a third case, namely that the number of skiing days is somewhere between 3 quarters times b and b. Now again, the optimal offline solution is k. And what happens now? I might have added up here, by the way, that we in either case we buy the skis after having rented them because this is hap this is different now if we then if we now consider what is the expected cost of our algorithm then again we get something similar we get a half times something plus a half times something but now, this first thing, this is only k now. And this second thing is 3 quarters times b minus 1 plus b. Why this? Because, okay, this second thing is just, again, the same. We rent 3 quarters times b minus 1 times and then buy. And this first thing, this is just we ran the skis only k times. And here you can again do the math. I won't show this to you in more detail what is happening here you get again that this is at most 15 over 8 times k, which is again 15 over 8 times the cost of the optimal offline solution. Good, so this also proves our theorem. This is it. How did we do this? We did this exactly the same way as we did it before. Namely, we did a case distinction. in how many skiing days are there in our sequence? And let's compare what our algorithm does 
to what an optimal offline solution does. In a with a more sophisticated approach, you don't actually have to do this. This is something that we'll see later this semester. How can we um, design an algorithm, a randomized algorithm for the ski rental problem, which doesn't do a case distinction this way, but rather how can we analyze this in a, um, in a more sophisticated way, just trying to mimic always what the optimal solution, what the optimal offline solution is doing. By the way, why can we do better? Just as a rule of thumb, here there's still the case in which we are beating the optimal offline solution or where, where we are much better than this factor of 15 over 8, there we're just as good as the optimal offline solution. So there is something, there's the point where we're leaving something on the table. Whereas down here, there's not so much gap left. But the point that I wanted to make here was, okay, via just one random coin flip, you can even do better than 15 over, uh, than two, even for large B, having this 15 over eight, which is, well, the point being, this is smaller than, than 2, and this is better than what you can achieve for any randomized, uh, for any deterministic algorithm if b is bigger than 8, if I'm not mistaken. Good. But still, you may ask is this a realistic model that we want to? that we just do things without seeing anything, without having any prior knowledge, without being able to anticipate what the remainder of my life is like? Um, that's a good point and this is why I'd like to now give you at least a quick example of what a different algorithm, uh, of, of what a different model of uncertainty could also look like here. And I'd now like to take the opportunity to also give you an idea of what a different model for ski rental might look like. This is something I just came up with myself. This is not something that you'll find in the literature, although generally it is along the lines of what people study. Maybe they'll study this in a more sophisticated way. And also, you will be able to solve these kinds of problems yourself um, later this semester. What will my model look like? Once again, this is a very simple stylized model, just to give you an idea of what, you, what else you can do here. Namely, the idea is as follows. Every morning, somebody flips a coin and with probability Q, you go skiing that day and of course with probability 1 minus q you don't and I want to underline that these coin flips are independent. Now you could of course do the same kind of analysis, namely what, what 
uh, what will the cost be of our of any algorithm that you're given that you're using compared to the optimal offline solution on any particular sequence so if you now have some, a, a guarantee like for every sequence this is something that you could also do but this is not meaningful here because it neglects the fact that some sequences are much more unlikely than others. And so here what you might want to do is you might want to uh, consider something like the expected cost of our algorithm where now this expectation is taken over the random sequence. So this is something that you want to be aware of, which this, this term looks exactly the same, but I might not have a deterministic algorithm. But the sequence sigma, this might be random. Sometimes people indicate this by making some subscripts at the expectation. Usually in our lecture it will be just clear from the context what the expectation is taking over, so this is not crucial. But once again, so sigma would now be a random variable and maybe the algorithm is even deterministic. And in this case, we can even ask, what is the best algorithm that minimizes this quantity? Because before we had, we couldn't even ask what was the best algorithm, because the algorithm's performance still depends on the sequence there. And we only compared always the algorithm to the offline optimum. Here we can just simply ask the question, what is the best algorithm on this particular, um, on the way we, gen uh, we generate sequences now, given that some sequences are much more likely than others. And indeed, what you can find out is that In this case, the optimal algorithm does the following. If we let T be the first day of skiing, And if there are now uh, at least b minus 1 over q plus 2 days left, then by the skis, otherwise Rent them throughout the sequence. I think this is interesting for a very particular reason, namely, in this model now, suddenly the optimal algorithm that minimizes this quantity never first rents then buys the skis, but it rather says, okay, I said definitely buy the skis the first day I will go skiing, because it is likely enough that I'll go skiing often enough, or it says I just rent my skis. And then I will rent them throughout the sequence. The reason is that here, even at the beginning, you have perfect knowledge of what's going to happen. Probably the correct answer is somewhere in between, that you have 
some knowledge in, in advance how good things are, but then over time you get to know even better how likely it is that we will go skiing again. We will also see some models to capture things like these. Maybe not exactly for this ski rental problem, but for, for other very simple problems. This result here, this actually turns out to be a simple exercise once you've uh, seen Markov decision processes and you've seen how to compute optimal policies there, then this is, um, this is really a very simple exercise that you can just do yourselves proving this claim. Okay, so this gives you an idea of what we are doing this semester. As I was saying, the first part will be about competitive analysis as we've seen it today. But then we'll consider also stochastic optimization problems like this here, which you can capture as a mark of decision process. And then afterwards, we'll also talk about online learning, which is maybe more of the idea that you are getting more information about what is likely to happen. So in this case, that you would get more precise knowledge about how likely it is that you go skiing only over time. This is it for today. Please reach out to me if you have any questions. I hope you enjoyed it and hope you also watch the next video. And let's hope that we can also meet each other sometime again soon. In the meantime, stay safe. Bye.